Blitz is on a mission to automate software creation, but we thought it's pretty good if we can get a six month project down to a six day project. So Sid and I took Jeff's class a year ago. We sat there, I don't think your name's Katie. Uh, we sat there and there, right? And so hopefully this can be a little bit of a roadmap of for the ECs that are graduating here in May and you fast forward four or five months, that's basically where we're at from a point in time. So uh, there is life after HPS, this is, this is our take on it. And today we'll talk about what we're calling the AI accelerated path to product market fit. So first, like what is Blitzy? Blitzy is on a mission to automate software creation, but we thought it's pretty good if we can get a six month project down to a six day project. And so that was really our going in point to say we've reached kind of success from a product technology perspective, and then we're gonna deploy that to, to the market. But first, who here is taking launching tech ventures this semester or next semester? The most popular class at HBS, like five of you, right? Okay. <laughs> so at launching tech ventures, <laughs> you, uh, you do a final project. And uh, so this is from one year and 10 days ago. Sid and I created Blitzy as a part of the LTV final. And we went all in on this thing. So a few things that we did to help accelerate on the experimentation mindset was like, you know, I was a founder pre-Gen AI and a founder post-Gen AI. So pre-Gen AI, you would like make a lander, you'd like make an ad, and like you'd see your clicks and you'd try to book somebody into a meeting and you'd, that would take like two days. It was really painful, right? So we launched 15 landing pages and 300 ads across lots of different personas with lots of different message market fit to know what is resonating with which consumer, which persona, so we know where to focus at from our initial wedge into the market. The next thing we did is we went into rapid prototyping. So instead of just having that message, we had a product they could see and feel and visualize to say, are we even on the right path from a design perspective to deliver a completely new product experience? And then, the last photo is uh, me after like three nights of building our first MVP. Uh, I am not the technical founder here. I'm not even close. And so like most people think this is the, uh, this is the, like, hey, go do it yourself, build it yourself. This is actually uh, an advertisement to find a technical co-founder. You can see how tired I look. I'm kind of like gaunt, sucked in at the cheeks, right? Like shooting this video for Sid on, uh, on how I built this MVP. And then he's like, dude, you should have just told me. <laughs> like I would have done this in like 20 minutes. Uh, but in 2023, the kind of first MVP to market was uh, you could call a number. An AI voice agent would pick up. They would scope your product, ask you 10 questions, and then they would text you your scope right to your phone, right? With a really, really bad wireframe that could go into us. This is sort of our top of funnel activity to drive users into, uh, into the experience. So this is what we did for one class, for one final. And uh, if you take LTV, you'll get feedback on your final, but the feedback might also come from AI. So Sid and I submitted this and we were amped. We were like, dude, we nailed this. Like, I was a pretty bad student here, actually. Uh, but this one, I got right. And uh, so we, we got the AI grades back and, uh, oh man, the AI hated it. <laughs> <laughs> the AI told us this isn't even feasible. This won't scale. This won't work in the real world. And maybe most frustrating is uh, this isn't even unique. And so. Just, just to be <laughs> fair, two things. <laughs> instant product project feedback to the students but I actually do grade them personally what was so great about the AI that Jeff built though is uh, it actually matched almost all the feedback we got in the real world so this is pretty much exactly what the venture capitalist told us as well and so it was actually a pretty good embodiment of the state of belief in the market at the time uh, so there was actually quite a bit of value but as Jeff mentioned, you know, we had faith. We went all in on this project. This is what we're gonna spend 10 years of our life on. And a human's gonna come in and look at our work and say, wow, you guys nailed it. I was like, this is gonna be my first one at HBS. Like I was feeling pretty good about it. It, it wasn't. <laughs> the humans came in, they said performance, average. <laughs> but that didn't stop us. So. We took this concept, which was using technology, using a series of algorithms that Sid invented to drastically reduce the time it takes to go from a near concept into a near production ready code. 
And a lot of people didn't believe us, so we went to market and actually just started building software for clients. I would go acquire the clients, we would use our own technology, and we would build it. And we had this view that we'll go to market as a dev agency, we'll acquire as many clients as we can, we'll serve them way faster than other people, and as soon as we can meet that goal, a six-month project, fully vetted and scoped by other people that's gonna take six months, completed on six days on our part, our technology is truly differentiated, and we can launch our platform to the world. So this is what life looked like for us after we walked across the stage. On the acquisition side, we used a lot of the things that you saw on the last slide, which was using AI to rapidly acquire customers. We executed the goal, which we'll talk about here, which is six month project, huge financial services project, which take a large team of 20 folks and drastically compress that down. And that was done really in the three months. And since September, 2024, we're now offering the platform to the world. So Sid will talk a little bit about this kind of key technology moment for our history. I will take it. We'll take it from there. So this was um, a lender based in New York. They were a B2B lender of last resort. And they were using the SaaS product. And it was a pretty complicated SaaS product. So they used to receive emails with lending applications from brokers. The email had an application form that described the the borrower, their business, their years in revenue, the owner's information. It had some attachments about proofs like bank statements, cancel checks and whatnot. And you needed to classify um, all of the attachments, get all the information from the application form, store that in a database, and then send notifications when this process was complete that they could keep track of with an API and using a dashboard. So this involved a lot of complex systems working together. There was OCR clearly involved for parsing the application forms. And there were emails and a lot of cloud services working together as well, orchestrating to get this done. We, we started with uh, taking this project and getting it out to agency, other agencies out there to see what they thought about the complexity of this. The estimates we got ranged from six months to nine months with about three to six developers working full time assigned to this project to get it done. It was about 30,000 lines of code. Now, 30,000 lines of code is something that is quite complex. If you were to take a project like this and give it to any of the chatbot out there of your choice, pick Cursor, pick Claude, anyone, and have it generate code, it's going to cut you off at about 800 lines of code because that's about the size of the output tokens that any of the model supports, which is about 8,000 if you use the best ones, and about 4,000 on an average, with an input context window of about 200,000 tokens. So there's no chance that 30,000 lines of code is going to fit in a single run. If you want to try running it multiple times, well, good luck with that, because every single time you give an input prompt to a model and have it generate code, there's only a 70% chance that it gets everything right. Which is why if you, if you go to YouTube and if you look at the videos where people are using these tools to generate stuff, there's a lot of reprompting to get things right. You, you run it once, you get an error, you go back to the AI and you say, hey, fix this error and you regenerate the code and then maybe hopefully you can get close to a mini app that works with about 1500 lines of code. So th all of that is just to give you context of this, the scope here and the complexity of this problem with 30,000 lines of code. Like Brian said, we built this in six days with one engineer. Well, that engineer is myself, so that's, that's a little bit of cheating, but <laughs> our, our vision is that we can build products like this in six days with one recent graduate. That's when it's truly magic. But hey, even with a senior engineer building stuff in six days, that's pretty cool, if you will. There are engineering teams that cost 10 times as much and that take many orders of magnitude as long. We, they, the lender used this in production. They still use it today. They pay us every single month and they replaced a SaaS vendor that they were using and paying for this for something that was much cheaper. And if you think about, uh, before I tell you about the platform, if you think about how we did this, it's a flip of the mindset. Existing development that works today is AI supported, where you have engineers using copilots, coding copilots, and there's research out there that says copilots make you 40% more efficient at writing code, which is great, right? So you, you can then do a nine month project in maybe five months, which is wonderful. 
But what if you still have AI uh, that's filling in and supporting the humans, but what if you could flip that and have AI do most of the work and only have the humans fill in and do the rest? And if you think about that theoretically, you're not very far off and you're, not, you're certainly not misled because if you read the reports that, um, if, if you read the reports out there about open source um, software, it says that 80% of all commercial software is written by AI. So if 80% of all commercial software is open source, that means AI has seen it in some form or the other because all of these models have been trained on open source data, right? So it's, it's not far to think, when you, when you hear of Google using AI to write 25% of all of their code, that makes sense. What we've done is that we've accelerated the timeline by using AI to build the AI platform and get to a place where you can generate 25,000, if not 30,000 lines of code using AI. We have examples where we've generated 50,000 lines of code, and we did that by getting 3,000 agents to collaborate with each other. And that's how you overcome the 8,000 token limit. And if you, if you look at the platform today, the way it works is any development team can use our platform, generate something new, or connect it to an existing product get a technical specification that you can review and edit because I spent eight years at NVIDIA and during my time there, most of development was about planning. It was about how do you write a good technical specification, how do you align on what the requirements are, and then hand that off to the engineering team that they can build. And they can have follow-ups, which is fine, but it's all about planning. Recently, when OpenAI put out the O1 model, they got recognized for doing 20 seconds of thinking before getting the output. And the outputs had higher ELO scores. They were high quality. They solved the problem of how many hours there are in strawberry just by doing that. When we generate 30,000 to 50,000 lines of code, our platform thinks for 10 hours. The job run for 12 hours, but 10 hours of that process is thinking. And we're not using our own models, like Jeff said, we're using the models out there. There's Claude 3.5, there's GPT-4.0. We're using multiple different models that are collaborating together to get this done. And this is all built with the state-of-the-art technology. So, so that's to give you context of why thinking is important. And that leads us, we still don't claim that it's 100% there because there's a lot of other things to get right. Coding is an incredibly hard problem to solve. There's tons of things like dependencies, circular dependencies, problems with bu bugs and, and stuff like that. We claim it's 80% build. We identify all of those problems and we create a document that the humans can then review and take it to 100% completion. So that's, that's on a high level what we're doing on the development side and I'll pass it back to Brian to talk, talk about the rest of the company. So we very much have a view that all startups should aim to be AI native. And like we took the lessons from LTV a year ago and drove those all the way through to how we built the company today. So across sales, marketing, design, product development, every person on our team starts with AI to solve their problem. So just a couple ideas, right? Like autonomous prospect research. If you have a LinkedIn profile of who you're going after, there's 3000 more people that are just like that, that a custom cloud project can go and help create a lead list for you. If you're launching ads, before you launch and spend capital on the 15 ads, you can get feedback from that persona being AI on what's actually gonna convert that user into your funnel and be entering at the second level of iteration when you're launching ads out into the world to drive people into your product experience. When you're designing something, you can start with easy prototyping tools to get something visual in front of your customer without having to hire a designer. I think these slides might have been made by AI that Jeff used with Gamma.app. And then of course, on engineering, what we're building and launching to the world is gonna completely change the paradigm of what is expected from a software developer. You have to be able to have domain knowledge and think critically about solving the problem and be able to come in and only develop the last mile tasks. So the level of personalization, the level of in-depth software is only gonna be limited by the engineer's creativity. And then finally, we always like to say leadership is always done the old-fashioned way, which is why we're all at Harvard Business School to become leaders and managers. And if you want your company to be AI native, you have to lead and be AI native yourself and say, what can we use AI to solve this problem with as a starting point? 
and will be by example to have the rest of the company follow you. So I'll pause there. First, thank you guys very much.